welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, you know we're going to have a great day when we're already having to put more seats in the room uh, to have a great conversation about future cooperation in the Arctic. Let me also welcome you on behalf of my colleague, Dr. Andy Cutchins. Where is Andy? Right there. Uh, Andy uh, is my uh, co-part, my partner in crime in some ways on a project uh, that we're currently working on uh, that examines uh, the Russian Arctic, uh, looking at interesting developments uh, in that portion of the Arctic, and as well looking at uh, a cooperative roadmap, if you will, for future cooperation in the Arctic. And this research that we have been engaged in has been due to the generosity of the MacArthur Foundation. We have a very rich day of discussion ahead of us. And um, I, I think it goes without saying that as we've been working on this research uh, about creating this roadmap for international cooperation, we've had a few significant geopolitical twists and turns uh, since the annexation of Crimea for this roadmap that we are creating, and it has challenged us to look at the Arctic cooperative terrain, if you will, uh, in, in a very new way. And it, it further challenges us to, to think about some assumptions that we have had about the future of Arctic cooperation. So this entire conference, this day of conversation, is designed to fully explore this new terrain and to dive deeply into the most promising areas of Arctic cooperation, although it is by no means an exhaustive list of, of many of the cooperative programs that we are engaging in the Arctic. But what we want to do is today assess where we are and then where we want to be in the future. So if I may talk you a little bit through the day's conversation. So our first panel will offer you, if you will, a Google Earth view of this terrain and giving us at the big strategic level, what does the future of Arctic cooperation look like and why is it important? And then our subsequent panels on science and research, marine safety and shipping, economic development, fisheries, and the marine environment, it's going to be more like a Google map. So how do we really figure out where we're heading in these areas of cooperation? And then our, our capstone of today is to have a discussion of what all of this means for the upcoming chairmanship, the US chairmanship of the Arctic Council, which begins in 10 months. I have been talking about the U.S. chairmanship for five years, and to say it's in 10 months makes my heart pound. It, it actually causes a heart attack for Ambassador Bolton, I'm sure. But uh, here is, uh, so what we want to do in looking at 10 months that are coming up very quickly, we want to figure out with our map, how do we move this important agenda forward? So that's sort of the method or the madness behind the method of our conversation today. So with that, I, I just want to give a, a concluding reflection, but I'll go ahead and ask uh, Ambassador Bolton and Ambassador Yeltsin and Dr. Zagorski, come on up here, because we're going to slide right into that Google Earth look at the Arctic. But I want to end with a, just a reflection. Um, I often hear from uh, my Alaskan colleagues uh, a wonderful story. So in the north, neighbor must help neighbor. It's a matter of life and death, uh, of, of, of survival. So the story goes, and this was told recently by uh, Kip Knudsen, who, is the, who directs the Washington office of Alaskan uh, Governor Sean Parnell. He, he mentions that you know, when in, in Alaska or in the high north, when someone has a flat tire and is on the side of the road, they can't seem to change the tire. Why? Because everyone is stopping to say, can I help you? Can I help you? What do you need? How, do you, how, how can I be of assistance? Now, I can't say that this same spirit is felt on the Capitol Beltway when someone has a flat tire, but it is certainly uh, very present among the family, and I consider this a family, of Arctic officials and experts 
and academic colleagues, their generosity uh, uh, and, and, and willingness to give their time and their talents to talking about the Arctic absolutely is representative today. We have colleagues that have flown from Moscow, from Fairbanks, uh, from, uh, from Canada, and they have willingly said, yes, I want to come and talk about the future of Arctic cooperation. So uh, it is my uh, great uh, thanks that, in particular, our next, our first panel, absolutely represents that spirit of, of help and, and generosity. So with a very warm welcome, and thankfully, it's so hot outside, thinking cool Arctic thoughts is probably the best thing we can do today. We welcome you, we thank you uh, for your attention and for your participation in this event. And uh, without further ado, I'm gonna switch places and we will talk about the future of Arctic cooperation. Thank you. Good morning. I'd like to thank Heather, Andy, CSIS for organizing this event and for inviting me here to speak. I guess, yes, a Google Earth overview is in order to start. Uh, what I did to prepare is took my to-do list for the Arctic and turned it into a kind of Google Earth review. Uh, that list has not changed particularly, despite recent events. Our ability to get some of this done made be a little different, but I thought it was important at least to start this conversation by going over the things that I think need doing in the Arctic over the next few years. Some of this will relate to our upcoming chairmanship of the Arctic Council, some of it will not. Some of it is outside that framework. So I'll divide my um, remarks into three short, very short um, segments. First, a set of what I call unfinished business, things that are already are in train that need finishing sometime, hopefully soon. Second, a couple of steps that I think the United States needs to take in effect at home to be uh, an even stronger Arctic player. And then a sort of look ahead, things over the horizon. <clears throat> These don't break down in, as entirely separate categories, but I think you'll see as I begin what I'm talking about. There are huge topics <clears throat> in the Arctic about which the countries, the stakeholders involved have already been engaged for some significant time, but there's more work to be done. One has to do with the oil and gas, other hydrocarbon, uh, other uh, minerals that are there. We have an agreement among the eight countries on oil pollution preparedness and response. We need to implement that. We need to continue with the work on oil pollution prevention. There is more to do there. In addition to working as a group of eight with our industries and other stakeholders, there are also for the United States some bilateral relationships we have on oil pollution issues, including with Russia, with Canada. We need to build those out. The IMO also, the International Maritime Organization, obviously has a role here as well with respect to oil pollution from ships. Similarly, we have in place now, actually the very first agreement among the eight Arctic nations on search and rescue. But it is still a work in progress in terms of actually providing effective, adequate search and rescue capability throughout the Arctic region. Most people would say we are not nearly there yet. We have a framework actually multiple frameworks for working on search and rescue, we are beginning to work together more effectively uh, to prepare for emergencies in the, in the north, but we are not what I would call ready. The nations of the high north have boundary and continental shelf issues that are on their way to getting resolved but are not yet fully resolved. Those of you familiar with the law of the sea process know that in the central Arctic there is an area that um, is going to be subject of overlapping claims to continental shelf um, by five nations. 
Uh, we are sort of somewhere in the middle of the process, I would say, of uh, the process of uh, submitting claims to the C Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf and then ultimately resolving boundaries where they overlap. The United States, of course, is on the outside of this process in some sense looking in, and I'll tell, talk more about that in a minute. But this is part of the unfinished business of the Arctic, resolving overlapping claims. And for those of you who think, or the, some people in the press who think that we're going to be sending battleships up there to do that, no, we're going to be sending lawyers and <laughs> geographers and oceanographers and hydrologists, uh, and those are the ways these will get resolved. There are three other topics of great interest to me that will be the subject of later talks today, so I'm not going to say very much about them, other than the fact that these are part of the unfinished business of the Arctic, uh, ensuring safe and reliable shipping. Dr. Brigham will be talking more about that. Uh, there is very good work underway, much more still to do. There is the prospect of unregulated high seas fishing in the central Arctic. We need to prevent that. Um, and there is uh, work heading in that direction about which I'm actually pretty excited, and we'll be talking more about that on a later panel. And we must um, strengthen our understanding of Arctic science. We must improve cooperation related to scientific research. Um, and that, too, is the subject of a later panel. There is work underway, primarily through the Arctic Council. We'll be hearing more about that later. Those, to me, those are the, that's the package of unfinished business that I see. Here at home, we have a couple of things that I really, we must do. Uh, one is to finally accede to the Law of the Sea Convention. The convention has some real importance in the Arctic. We are the only Arctic nation not party to this. It is hurting us in the continental shelf uh, area. But it is also um, undermines our credibility elsewhere in the world in lots of ways to be on the outside of the convention looking in. And uh, the Arctic seems to be one of a couple of the strongest arguments we have to persuade the remaining doubters that it's really in our natural, national interest to join this treaty. The second thing we really need to do at home is to prepare for our upcoming Arctic Council chairmanship. And let's talk a little bit about the timeline for that. This too will be the subject of a later panel. The plan for any country's chairmanship gets embedded in and adopted at, um, well, embedded in documents and adopted at the ministerial meetings of the preceding chair. We are currently in the Canadian chairmanship. It will wrap up next April or May. And we need to be creating a, a program for that, that the other seven countries of the Arctic and the permanent participants and the stakeholders uh, will ultimately agree to and put into uh, the documents adopted at the Canadian ministerial. That negotiation with the other nations is likely to take place late next fall through the winter and the early spring. In order to prepare for that, we need to solidify our thinking here at home. Uh, the agencies involved in the Arctic, uh, the agency of the federal government, have been working on this for some time. We have some uh, pretty good ideas that are um, in the hand. We need to seek and fold in input from a variety of people in our own country who care a lot about this, including the state of Alaska, the Alaska congressional delegation, the indigenous peoples of Alaska, other concerned citizens, industry, et cetera. And we ultimately need to get a blessing from this at the highest political levels here. And then, we can, then, we, then and only then will we be in a position to negotiate this program with the other, others involved in the Arctic Council process. As chair, we don't dictate what happens in the Arctic Council. We do have some significant influence, but ultimately it's a consensus-based organization. We need to sell it. We need to sell a program and listen. We need to listen to the ideas of others. But looking ahead, what will that chairmanship likely touch on? Well, we don't really know yet, but I have a pretty good hunch about a few things, and I bet you do too if you've been paying attention. Climate and climate change is likely to be at least some focus of what the Arctic Council is involved in 
the next few years. Certainly here in the United States, this administration, this administration has a renewed focus on climate issues. There is climate work specific to the Arctic still to be done, some of which is already underway. I'm guessing that some large feature of the U.S. chairmanship will involve climate issues. Another sort of basket of things that I think will figure prominently has to do with improving the economic and living conditions for the people who actually are in the Arctic. This is something that's already started, particularly under the Canadian chairmanship, that is uh, still a work in progress, but it, it has a lot of support here in the United States, particularly in Alaska. We can talk, talk more about that later. Health issues, another um, issue of particular importance to our indigenous communities in Alaska. And the third thing, and this is the one where maybe your input, all of you, particularly the uh, think tank community, would be most, I'd be most interested to hear about, is what can we do during the U.S. chairmanship to actually strengthen the Arctic Council regime? We have an evolving set of um, ideas. The Council itself is stronger now than it was 10 years ago. A lot of that change it seems to be accelerating in some ways. Is there a prospect for taking it another step or two? What would that look like? What more can the Arctic system look like? And what can we do as chair to lead it in that direction? That is a really interesting question to me, um, and I'd be eager to get input from all of you on that. That's the 60,000-foot view, Heather, as least as I see it. Thanks very much. Dave, thank you so much. I was so excited about uh, your remarks. I failed to introduce you. My big apologies for that. I, I, I assume that you need no introduction, but that's not right. Uh, Dave is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State uh, for Oceans and Fisheries in the Bureau of Oceans and International and Environmental and Scientific Affairs. Whew, that's a big title. Um, Dave, uh, his responsibilities are overseeing U.S. foreign policy related to the Arctic and Antarctica. He also has a, a global fisheries responsibility. And uh, you, uh, the Arctic uh, is your focus, but you were very involved in uh, last week's extremely successful Oceans Conference, so we congratulate you on that, and we thank you very much for making time, as you always do, uh, to, to be with us. I'd like to now uh, introduce Ambassador Ken Yalowitz. Uh, Ken is a global fellow at the Kennan Institute at the Wilson Center. Prior to uh, his engagement at the Wilson Center, uh, Ken uh, directed the Dickey Center for International Understanding at Dartmouth College, where he was very engaged in an Arctic uh, research effort, uh, something that I was involved in as well, and has, has really been a, a thought leader on many of the diplomacy, if you will, uh, of, of Arctic policy. Ambassador Yalowitz has uh, had a distinguished queer career in the Foreign Service, uh, previously serving as U.S. Ambassador to Belarus and to Georgia, and is very familiar with uh, uh, Russian affairs from two tours in Moscow. So, uh, Ken, we're grateful that you were here. Thank you for taking time to be with us. Thank you very much, Heather. Uh, my congratulations to you, to Andy Cutchins and CSIS. You guys have done a brilliant job, uh, you know, in, in bringing Arctic issues, you know, to the forefront in Washington and preparing for uh, the U.S. chairmanship of the Arctic Council. Uh, I just, on a personal note, I wanted to say that uh, this is a very unusual uh, situation for me, usually with why, I'm always the last speaker at everything, and uh, for once, Dr. Zagorski is here, so, uh, uh, you know, as I said, I, I look forward to hearing his comments, but for once, I'm not the cleanup hitter, so uh, this is very, very welcome to me. Um, I wanted to uh, just very briefly uh, talk about, uh, you know, some of the challenges, uh, areas of cooperation, but then focus more on some of the uh, political strategic issues, you know, that, that I see uh, coming. In terms of areas of cooperation, I think David has really, you know, um, you know mapped them out beautifully. But I wanted to add uh, just a few others, just from my own experience and from what others have talked about uh, that, that I think are, are, need, are going to need to be uh, faced. Uh, one of the things I know from uh, Lawson Brigham, who's here, uh, is that so much of the Arctic, you know, the waters are simply not been charted. Uh, we don't really know a heck of a lot. 
And it strikes me that you know, when we look at areas you know, for cooperation in the future, uh, that's an area that's in everyone's interest and that we need to, uh, to focus on weather conditions. Uh, also another area that uh, I think could be, you know, could be very, very productive. Um, I think we'll get into this in a little bit, but, uh, you know, and that is our military to military cooperation uh, and Coast Guard cooperation. Uh, as Heather mentioned, you know, we're in a different, um, you know, environment right now, uh, but I still see, you know, very good prospects, you know, for moving ahead uh, in, in those areas uh, as well. But let me talk about uh, some of the, the political challenges. Um, we're obviously not going to have a new um, Arctic Treaty along the lines of the Antarctic Treaty. And my own feeling, and a lot of my thoughts on this have been shaped by working with uh, Professor Orrin Young, and that is that you know, there is you know, a, a basic structure in place. Uh, there is not going to be, in all likelihood, a new Arctic Treaty. Uh, and the structures that are in place you know, can be modified and worked with, as David has suggested, uh, to meet the challenges of the future. Uh, but what are some of the, the major concerns that are on my mind? One uh, is I think we all keep reading about you know, the new great game up in the Arctic. Uh, periodically, there's a very bombastic article talking about you know, military buildups on all sides. Uh, the wealth of, you know, oil and gas up there, and, you know, from the realist perspective, inevitably there's going to be conflict. Well, obviously there is potential, but I don't think it's, it's a very great potential. And to me, that's probably the greatest challenge, you know, not, not only to uh, prevent that from happening, but also to deal with the steady flow of, of bombastic articles to get the correct story out there in terms of what actually is going on in the Arctic. And David, again, you know, talked about uh, on the boundary issues that it's going to be fought more in the courtroom than anywhere else. And I think that that's absolutely correct. But I think in terms of the public consciousness, uh, that, has to, uh, that has to, you know, to change. Um, obviously, uh, I'm sure Dr. Zagorski will speak about this, but, you know, the, the uh, U.S.-Russian relationship obviously has been complicated you know, by events in Crimea and Ukraine. Uh, it's certainly my hope, and I believe, you know, everyone that I talk with, uh, that the Arctic, you know, will be able to go forward. Uh, uh, you know, President Gorbachev was the one who first opened up, you know, the possibilities of cooperation in the Arctic at the end of the Cold War. A few years ago, President Putin talked about, you know, the Arctic as a zone of peace. And I very much hope that, you know, that those sentiments uh, are going to remain the same. Uh, it's not a given, uh, but certainly that is one of the areas that we're going to have to watch uh, very, very carefully. Um, another question uh, in talking about the Arctic Council itself and governance, several countries you know, were brought in at the last ministerial as permanent observer. But I think, you know, in terms of the issues facing the Arctic Council, this is going to be a very significant question. What will be the role of these, you know, new observers? How are they best going to participate? And particularly uh, China, which I think has made clear, you know, that it, it really wants to be a player, you know, in the Arctic. Uh, how are we going to be able to manage uh, the desire of countries, you know, to play a much more important role in the Council? when the Council to date, you know, has primarily been an organization, you know, of the Coastal Five plus three. And I would submit, you know, that that is another issue uh, that we're going to have to face, not being in the U.S. government any longer. I think I can talk about this. But there is a sense, you know, that the Arctic Council, on the part of some, has been a little bit on the closed side, sort of a, a gentleman's club, if you will, of the eight, you know, uh, permanent members. Uh, and that, uh, you know, that the voices of outsiders uh, need to be factored in more and more. And we keep saying that the Arctic, you know, is international, that all the issues of climate change are really international. They're not just, you know, focused on the Arctic. So I think we really are going to have to focus on this question of how to bring in, you know, the other, the other players, uh, you know, in terms of, of what's going on. David also mentioned the decisions on the, uh, the extended continental shelf. 
Uh, I, obviously, these are very important. All the countries concerned have committed themselves through the Ilulisat Declaration and other documents you know, to the law of the sea, to diplomatic solutions to these questions. But we haven't yet come to the point where decisions have been made, and perhaps some countries are going to win and some countries are going to lose. And I think that's another, you know, issue that is out there to be watched for is what are going to be the reactions, you know, when these, when these decisions are made. I certainly hope that this will remain, you know, an issue in courtrooms, but, you know, we don't know. Uh, and I mention also in that regard, you know, the question of whether the, the various, the two major north, uh, you know, north uh, channels, shipping channels, uh, are they international waters or are they, you know, domestic waters? Again, so far these things have been handled, you know, very peacefully and I don't see any reason why they shouldn't continue. But again, issues uh, that need to be um, kept in mind. And finally, um, as a sort of a semi-political scientist and aware of the various schools of thought, you know, in political science, uh, the liberals, the realists, uh, the Arctic really is a test case in many ways, uh, you know, for which school of thought is going to prevail. Uh, and I go back to where I began. The realists are positing continually, you know, that with all the oil and gas up there and the riches, the minerals, uh, that inevitably there will be conflict, you know, between states. Uh, the other side of the equation is that, you know, the law of the sea convention, diplomacy, uh, the Arctic Council, uh, that the mechanisms are there to handle all of these things. I personally agree with that, you know, uh, completely, but just posit, you know, that this is uh, an issue and we're going to have to keep that in mind very clearly. Thank you. Ken, thank you very, very much. Um, I'm going to have a slightly lengthier introduction of Dr. Andrzej Zakorski by way of explaining a bit. Um, as CSIS has embarked on nearly a two-year study uh, about the Russian Arctic and developing this international cooperative <coughs> roadmap, um, our partner in this project has been the Russian International Affairs Council. And uh, Andre, although he is not a uh, part of uh, the REAC, the International Affairs Council, he has been really the scholar in charge, as I would like to say, uh, of working on this project. And his scholarly work has been uh, really uh, extremely helpful in helping us think through how we could expand our cooperation. Uh, the Russian International Affairs Council in December, in partnership with CSIS as well as uh, Pew Charitable uh, Foundation was also involved in that, put on an extraordinary conference in Moscow in December. Uh, Ambassador Bolton was a participant, uh, David Hayes will be coming uh, part of our panelists. Some of us, we brought a delegation over to talk about this. And it was clear in December uh, how much of a priority the Arctic is to Russia and how eager we were to explore uh, and really be ambitious in our views of how to expand that cooperation. And Andre's work has really been instrumental in this process. Clearly, um, uh, events have changed the mood and the tenor of this approach, but Andrei Zagorski has been a complete stalwart in, in, in looking at a pragmatic approach to Arctic cooperation. Um, Andre is the director of the Department of Disarmament and Conflict Resolution at the Institute for World Economy and International Relations. He has served as a senior researcher at the Moscow Institute of International Relations, and he has had uh, a distinguished career, has written uh, well over 300 publications and extensive uh, uh, written, uh, written materials. Um, it's not easy in this current climate to be pragmatic. And uh, I think we should recognize and applaud. Thank you, Dr. Zagorski, for being here and offering a very pragmatic perspective on this. And he's been a great colleague to work with on this project. So with that, Dr. Zagorski, you are, as Ken would like to say, you are clean up. So, uh, and we, we, we thank you. Uh, thank you, Heather, for this kind introduction. And thank you for organizing this event. Uh, this is very helpful in taking further at least discussing cooperation, but I'm also uh, looking forward to increased cooperation of the Arctic Council as such. I understand our panel is uh, uh, sketching the issues at stake uh, on the agenda of Arctic cooperation. That's why 
I will be general in my remarks and we will uh, look uh, into more details uh, going into specific sectors of cooperation. And also probably uh, to take away before I go into substance, uh, exactly at the December conference, uh, Ambassador Bolton and I were talking on the panel on the US-Russian agenda for cooperation with Arctic and we did not diverge much. Now, well, the number of points was, I, I guess, uh, particularly the same. Uh, but we uh, were complementary in, in addressing several <coughs> different issues and putting this on the agenda, which I see very much reflected in, in our discussions here as well. So let me uh, of, offer you the way of structuring Arctic, uh, the agenda for the Arctic cooperation by looking at three major issues, because A, uh, the agenda for the Arctic cooperation is very much affected by the expectation of increased uh, economic activities uh, in the region. And we speak primarily, although not exclusively, about marine Arctic. Secondly, uh, the agenda is very much uh, affected by the associated challenges which occur as, as more economic activities occur, uh, in the, in the, particularly in the marine Arctic, but also in the terrestrial Arctic. Uh, and uh, number three, uh, it is uh, uh, opportunities for cooperation, which are linked to both, to the opportunities for economic activities as well as which are linked to the concerns and challenges uh, which arise uh, as we move <coughs> towards uh, working more actively in, in the Arctic. So let me briefly stop at these three levels. Uh, probably the shortest list would be the one which uh, is related to the economic activities because it's mainly three major areas uh, in which uh, economic activities are already uh, either already expanding or are expected to expand, on, although very much unevenly if we look at the marine Arctic uh, and at a pretty low pace if we look at the core uh, marine Arctic. Uh, one area is, uh, of course, attracting much of the attention uh, in public, uh, looking at the uh, possibilities for exploring and uh, extracting mineral resources of the Arctic. Much, has been, much of the debate has been triggered by the uh, U.S. Geological Service uh, uh, estimates, uh, which were totally uh, misunderstood by, by uh, most publics, uh, because many people were expecting that indeed one quarter of total energy reserves were located in the Arctic. But this is a growing area, although we see yet uh, very limited activities uh, in that area in the Arctic, particularly in the marine Arctic. The second is we already observe a growing uh, vessel traffic uh, in the Arctic, in all parts of the Arctic, although again, uh, pretty unevenly expanding. And there are expectations that uh, shipping will grow uh, in the years to come, um, thus uh, generating uh, particular concerns as regards the various maritime security issues. And number three, probably the first uh, industry to expand in the Arctic is fisheries, uh, which is pretty intensive now, but uh, at the margins of the Arctic, so to say, at the western and the eastern part, and expectations are linked to the uh, particularly melting uh, Arctic in the summer and the possibility for uh, emergence of new fisheries grounds uh, in the Arctic Sea. <coughs> So the uh, happening, already happening, uh, growing economic activities uh, uh, and expectations and anticipation of further growth are related to, secondly, concerns which have been increasingly raised in the debate over the Arctic uh, more recently. Uh, those concerns and challenges are mostly linked to issues like the preservation of the environment and the protection of the ecological systems of the Arctic and of biological diversity, everything which we include uh, this is not only concerning marine Arctic, this is also terrestrial Arctic, everything which includes uh, both environmental and environmental human uh, security in the Arctic. Concerns uh, grow with regard to the maritime security, particularly uh, as uh, shipping uh, is expected to grow, uh, it, and particularly in the remote areas of the Arctic, uh, still with very harsh uh, uh, climatic uh, and, 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 and weather conditions. Uh, the danger is growing and the concerns are growing that this may result uh, in, in uh, um, incidents uh, which may lead not only to the human uh, uh, aspects of security but also to oil pollution or whatever uh, other um, environmental damage else. 
Uh, we have the whole set, and colleagues have addressed this issue already, uh, a whole set of uh, issues which are linked to the sovereignty or sovereign rights, uh, which includes boundaries, although uh, there are not many issues left uh, open in terms of uh, boundaries delineation. Uh, this, is, this makes me pretty, pretty sure that uh, there will be no conflict uh, concerning the de de delineation of the boundaries, maritime boundaries in the Arctic. But definitely, definitely all, all, everything which is linked to the uh, extended continental shelf uh, est establishment of the limits of the continental shelf uh, is highly emotional, uh, at least in some countries of the Arctic uh, Council, and uh, at least the domestic debate will not be very easy, despite the fact, uh, despite of the fact that the countries have agreed uh, to an orderly procedure, and they stick to this so far as, 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 as long as we see. Uh, but this is, this is a longer term issue because I don't expect uh, uh, decisions to be fallen within the next 10 to 15 years. If I look at the whole procedure to go, not only submitting uh, the claims to the commission, but also going through the commission deliberations, including every country, only one country has done it so far. Norway, Russia has uh, submitted its claim. Uh, not a single other country has yet. So we are at the beginning of this road. Uh, I believe one issue which often remains outside uh, our view is, is uh, uh, securitization of the Arctic, although I see an evolving consensus uh, among both governments and scholars over the past years that uh, we shall not be very much concerned about military security in the Arctic. Still, we do have a lot of uh, securitization debates and definitely the environment, current international environment, does not help to, de to diffuse uh, those concerns, and we need to find the way, the appropriate way to address uh, the issue and desecuritize uh, the Arctic debate. Uh, finally, uh, last but not least, uh, of course, everything which is linked to the third countries, non-Arctic countries' activities, uh, rights and commitments obligations is, is also very much emotional in, in several countries uh, of the Arctic Council. And although we have uh, moved ahead on those issues very much, particularly last year with extending, uh, the, ex expanding the number of observers in the Arctic Council, uh, I see that uh, we, we still have to address many issues which, are which, which involve uh, third countries. That's why my third block is, uh, this is best done if we uh, look uh, at uh, opportunities for cooperation which open up in parallel with the opening uh, uh, operation opportunities in the Arctic, open, uh, the opening of opportunities for economic activities, but also uh, as if we look at the concerns and challenges uh, which we share in the Arctic. Uh, my basic assumption is that uh, if this were about the Arctic, we would have very little ground for uh, any conflict, although we see that Arctic is not isolated uh, from more general uh, developments. So there are many opportunities for cooperation, although I would probably say from the very beginning that uh, not every opportunity for cooperation is linked to the Arctic Council only. There are multiple institutions uh, through which we address issues, so we do have a lot of uh, uh, things which are uh, done <coughs> at the bilateral level through bilateral cooperation. We do have the Arctic Council as the leading regional cooperation or, uh, forum uh, although we do have a few more uh, in the region, and we do have several universal global uh, regimes and uh, institutions through which we address specific issues. Not everything fits exactly uh, on the agenda of the Arctic uh, Council. So when I uh, try to bring together the opportunities for economic activities and uh, opportunities to work together on the challenges uh, which we share in the Arctic, I come a pretty long list, and I will give you a short version uh, of this. So uh, there's a whole host of issues which are linked to the sustainable development and environmental security in the Arctic, and uh, uh, certainly this set of issues is most intensively addressed through various working groups of the Arctic Council, which um, provide an uh, invaluable contribution to uh, common common assessment of the developments and problems existing in the Arctic, and also looking for solutions, making recommendations on how member states of the Arctic Council may move ahead in addressing those issues. 
<coughs> we do have a, a whole set of issues which are linked to the adaptation, uh, particularly the indigenous population, but not only of them, to the changing climate in the Arctic. Uh, in some countries, uh, the awareness of those issues is, uh, is uh, very clear. Uh, and not only in Canada, but I believe also in Alaska, if we go to Alaska, because uh, some programs which uh, address the issue of climatic change consequences already go in Alaska. It is a growing awareness of those problems uh, in, in Russia, particularly because it also involves uh, a lot of changes in the Russian Arctic, uh, not, only, not only with regard to the indigenous populations, uh, which are numerous uh, in the Russian Arctic, but also with regard to the old infrastructure, uh, which is uh, really very much damaged by the changes, ongoing changes. We do have a whole set of issues of uh, developing infrastructure in the Arctic, developing infrastructure which would be up to date uh, and provide both uh, the possibilities to grab the opportunities which are opening with the changing Arctic, but also which would give us the possibility to, uh, to uh, uh, operatively react to any problem which may occur, like an ecological disaster, oil spill, or whatever else. Because uh, when we look now and talk, for instance, about uh, shipping, uh, we definitely recognize there is a pure lack of infrastructure of providing sec secure uh, shipping uh, uh, in, in any part of the Arctic uh, Ocean, having virtually no deep sea ports, having no bases where you can repair a ship if anything happens to you. Uh, with some growing capabilities for providing uh, disaster relief, but uh, certainly if we look at the search and rescue capabilities of um, uh, coastal states, uh, they are absolutely insufficient even for the modestly expected uh, uh, growth of economic activities. So looking at the infrastructure issues from every single point uh, of view is, is an important element, an important opportunity for Arctic councils, and not only Arctic councils, I would say, to work uh, together in the Arctic. We have several issues which are closely linked to the maritime security uh, issues. Uh, one of them is uh, looking forward to the development of a mandatory polar code, uh, which would uh, provide for more harmonized regulation uh, of uh, vessel traffic uh, in the Arctic uh, waters, not only Arctic or Antarctic, but particularly in our interest for the Arctic waters. Uh, but there are many other issues which occur in this regard, and uh, I would particularly here in Washington draw, draw attention to an upcoming issue of the uh, vessel traffic through the Bering Strait, uh, which is increasingly in the focus of our attention both in the U.S. and uh, in the Russian Federation. Next, we do have two uh, Arctic Council agreements, or rather agreements of Arctic Council member states, because it's not formally Arctic Council uh, agreements as such, one on the search and rescue and one on the oil pollution uh, preparedness and response. And uh, I believe uh, a very important uh, work ahead of us is to look forward to how we can boost cooperation uh, of our countries in uh, implementing uh, those agreements, because both agreements, uh, A, provide for the areas of responsibility of coastal states as regards search and rescue or oil preparedness and response, and secondly, uh, uh, provide for the ways of working together on specific issues. This involves, of course, a much closer bilateral cooperation on uh, those issues, but also opens the way for multilateral cooperation for making uh, the existing not sufficient uh, search and rescue and uh, disaster relief capabilities to be uh, interoperable and uh, for the, resp uh, the respective services to uh, start learning to work closer with each other. In this respect, I would uh, give one example because we do have improving Russian-Norwegian cooperation or rather Russian-Finnish-Norwegian cooperation on these issues, uh, which is supposed to provide uh, uh, an increased interoperability by providing co joint training of Russian-Norwegian-Finnish uh, uh, capabilities uh, in this area. We may look forward to developing something together with the United States. Uh, but certainly uh, this would, would take uh, uh, a better political climate, I believe, uh, to move ahead on, on this as well as on many other issues. So uh, developing constabulary cooperation on the soft security issues which we are challenged uh, in the Arctic is, in my view, 
one of the most important challenges, and uh, it will be particularly a challenge also to forthcoming Arctic Council chairmanships. Uh, I believe there was a very interesting proposal in the uh, U.S. implementation plan suggesting that every Arctic chairman, Arctic Council chairman, uh, should organize a, a biannual exercise uh, of involving capabilities from all Arctic states which address the questions of search and rescue, etc. And I'm eager to see that the U.S. chairmanship would implement this proposal and invite uh, all Arctic councils to, to join in such exercise. We have a host of issues on fisheries. Most of them have been raised so far. Let me simply emphasize that we do have bilateral fisheries issues uh, among uh, several Arctic states, which is a very cooperative way so far. Uh, but we also have some challenges ahead of us, and one of them is uh, fisheries in the central basin of the Arctic Sea, and we will talk more in detail on this at the specific panel on, on fisheries. Uh, Virtually in every section of Arctic cooperation agenda, we have science involved. And uh, we will have a special panel on this and may look deeper because on every issue which is involved, we need more uh, research and more cooperative research and sharing, uh, sharing research uh, data and expertise. And uh, I would go as far as to say that uh, if we look at the three major sectoral areas of activities, uh, we may uh, embark on a way of looking forward towards uh, bringing coastal states together in developing integrated ecosystem-based management approach towards different parts of the Arctic so far, but uh, probably then at the end of the entire Arctic as such. Uh, we do have some experience and we have made some progress between Russia and Norway uh, in uh, extending the integrated uh, ecosystem-based management of the Barents Sea. Uh, which is opera operational already in the Norwegian part of the Barents Sea, but we are pretty close to finalizing the research work and introduce specific plans uh, for introducing a coordinated uh, approach to the Russian part of the Barents Sea. Uh, we may look forward to uh, introducing similar uh, ways of looking at the uh, Bering and Chukchi Sea. Uh, and uh, as I understand, every single coastal state in the Arctic is embracing the integrated management approach, and we may see where we go uh, in terms of extending integrated uh, management uh, towards the whole Arctic Sea. My final point on the agenda is uh, security cooperation, which is getting difficult. Again, my point is I don't see any uh, military classical security issue to become a problem in the Arctic. I see mainly the task of desecuritizing the Arctic agenda and Arctic cooperation. We did make several steps forward in uh, developing some rudimental forums for discussing security issues, such as uh, two meetings of the heads of general staff uh, and coast, coast guards, such as uh, a round table of senior officials of coast guards and defense. Uh, this is probably an area which is most affected uh, by the current political situation, but I'm looking forward that, that we overcome this crisis and move, still move ahead uh, in terms of not compartmentalizing working in this area, but working together uh, on several issues. Uh, let, me, let me stop here and say, say, my last point would be to say, I see more opportunities for cooperation on the Arctic, on common issues, on shared challenges. Uh, it is up to us whether to take those opportunities or uh, uh, whether some of them remain uh, uh, unfulfilled promises. Uh, I don't see any challenge of confrontation in the Arctic, but again, the, the level of utilizing opportunities for cooperation uh, is something which is very much on the agenda. And I'm looking forward to the US chairmanship, and I'm eager to learn more about the forthcoming agenda, which is important for Russia. Uh, and I hope very much that the US, during its chairmanship on the Arctic Council, would contribute to helping all of us to utilize opportunities for cooperation rather than to miss them. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah that's absolutely. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Andre. That was a terrific, terrific overview. And thanks as well to, to Ken and Dave. You have kicked us off in a very great fashion because you give us a very broad brush 
of all the issues. And it's a massive to-do list, quite frankly, uh, Dave. What, we have about a half an hour for good discussion uh, and conversation. I'm going to kick off and ask our panelists a few questions. I could actually ask them a ton of questions, but I'll restrain myself. And then we'll turn to you. We have microphones. Um, if you could just raise your hand, give us, a, and, and I, a warning about this wonderful room. Sometimes you really have to get close to that microphone and speak very clearly for us to hear up here. Um, if you give us your name and your affiliation, we will take a few questions, we'll bundle them together, uh, and then we'll ask our panelists uh, to respond. So with that, are you guys ready? Because I'm ready to fire away here to, at some, some questions. First for Dave. Um, I'm, I'm extremely interested in how U.S. governmental leadership will tackle this impressive to-do list and anything, any whisper, any hint you could tell us about the U.S. Special Representative that was announced uh, by Secretary Kerry in March. But, but again, give us a flavor for how this, how this works. This is a profile opportunity for both your work uh, as well as uh, many, many interagency colleagues that will be engaged in this. Help us understand a little bit about the structure of how the U.S. government tends to lead uh, this process. And then I'm, I'm seized by the public diplomacy opportunity that this presents for us to understand about what the responsibilities are of an Arctic nation and our role. And I don't know, I, we, these are early days, so I'm probably getting a little ahead of myself, but what are some of the thinking about the public information that can be shared, particularly for the lower 48? It's not yeah. the state of Alaska, uh, but we need to educate, educate on this. And I'm just wondering if there, there are some early thoughts uh, for you on that. Andre, I'm so grateful that you raised economic development because one of the newest features of Arctic cooperation under the Canadian chairmanship has been the creation of an Arctic Economic Council. It's not part of the Arctic Council. It will be a standalone body. Um, and understanding where the private sector fits into this conversation, economic development, how do they uh, the, the various in, uh, industries and sectors, how do they help keep their voice uh, and, and their, what they're seeing engaged in this uh, very important Arctic conversation? I'd love both Andre, Ken, and Dave to, to respond to the, to the role of the private sector uh, in the Arctic. Um, and then, and finally, uh, a question on sort of the geopolitical environment in which we are all working in. And Andre, to pick up on, on your thought, there, it seems to me there's sort of two schools of thought that sort of are emerging in Washington about what all of this means for the Arctic. The one school of thought is that there will be what we call strategic overspill, that's the buzzword that we're using, uh, at least the think tanks are using, strategic overspill into the Arctic because, um, not only because of the importance of the Arctic to Russia's future development, um, but as we were reading headlines today, the potential for spillover of sanctions and what it means for technology uh, exchange. The other school of thought is actually the Arctic is going to be the place where we can begin to rebuild trust because it's something of mutual cooperation. And like the famous Gorbachev uh, zone of, of peace speech that sort of allowed the Arctic to become a place where we could have a conversation, um, perhaps this is a place to rebuild. And quite frankly, I can make a rational argument for both cases, so I would welcome the panelists' thoughts on whether uh, this is how they see this playing out. So Dave, I'm putting you in the hot seat first. My apologies, but I'm gonna make you work today, so thank you. Thank you, Heather. Well, you asked a number of different questions. Let me see if I can try to respond. Uh, Heather asked about the approach of the U.S. government in, in tackling this to-do list. Everybody here, I'm sure, is well aware that the United States federal government is a seamless web. We are linked up. <laughs> efficient. Uh, efficient. Absolutely. And, yes. Absolutely. Um, but you know, we have taken some steps <clears throat> to try to become the seamless web. We ought to be on this. Uh, some of it is uh, out there in the public. Uh, the president issued the national strategy for the Arctic region about a year ago, and we followed that up with an Im implementation plan. Um, these were efforts to try to identify our priority actions uh, in the Arctic, at least speaking to ourselves as uh, federal agencies, what are we trying to accomplish there? But it was also a messaging tool 
to the U.S. public, to the other governments out there. These are the things we're trying to do. And it does demonstrate this process was led by the White House, a uh, very high-level interest in this region. And uh, many people in this room representing various uh, agencies were involved, as, as was I. Um, part of that national strategy and the implementation plan are about the Arctic Council and about our coming chairmanship. We actually have put into these documents some thinking uh, of what we hope to accomplish uh, as, as chair. Um, generally speaking, um, on the Arctic Council, the Department of State sort of is the lead representative, but it is a very collabor collaborative uh, collegial exercise, at least among the federal family. Uh, when the United States assumes the chair, our Secretary of State will be the chair of the Arctic Council, at least as long as he is in office. One thing about the coming chairmanship is that it is going to span into the next administration, right? Our, the end of our chairmanship will be in the spring of 2017. We will have a new president, a new Secretary of State. That's part of the thinking now. We need to be prepared for the fact that this will have to cross over into another administration. With that, I will share a piece of thinking that is uh, out there in the public. Um, this administration may wish to have some um, large event relating to the Arctic on its watch, right? Um, usually the biggest moment in any Arctic Council chairmanship is the end, the last moment, the, the ministerial meeting that you host in which you showcase all of the good work that's been done for two years, you pass the torch or the baton to the next chair and you look ahead to the future. That will take place, as I said, in the next administration. So it's possible that uh, in this administration, perhaps in 2016, some other large event on the Arctic could take place and we are actually mulling that over right now. Um, yes, Secretary Kerry announced uh, now some time ago that he would appoint a special representative for the Arctic region. And uh, I don't have any real news to share about that with you, except to stay tuned. I think an announcement is likely to hit quite soon. Um, speaking personally, this is good news for me. We have been um, wanting this person on board to help uh, with the preparations for the Arctic Council chairmanship and to, do, so, and to help lead, oversee a lot of the other work going on in the Arctic, even beyond the Arctic Council. Um, that's about all I can say about that at the moment. One more thought and then I'll stop. Um, you asked about public diplomacy. We, the United States, have one, uh, operate at one disadvantage relative to the other seven Arctic countries and that is um, most of our citizens don't think very much about the Arctic, even today despite all the new attention that has been turned to the Arctic in the press and otherwise. I see our coming chairmanship as a chance to help educate people in the lower 48 about your profound U.S. interests in the Arctic, about the Arctic region as a whole, and why it should matter to them on a lot of fronts. So it's a kind of bully pulpit that I'm hoping we will use to good effect uh, to, to make our fellow citizens aware of this region. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Ken, do you want to chime in on any or all of the questions? And then we'll have Andre finish up. Um, first of all, uh, you asked about the role of business. And I, I, I have absolutely no uh, doubt that that's a very important area that that's going to have to be, um, you know, work together in, in cooperation. Uh, the Arctic, unlike the Antarctic, you know, is being developed. Uh, some of the largest, you know, mineral mines in the world are there. This is not something that's starting from scratch. This has been a long process that's going on for a long time. And uh, I know, though, from other discussions, you know, the question of, of how to bring business in is not going to be easy. Uh, there are many different types of industries involved. There are many different companies involved. And how you sort of capture all of them is not going to be easy. But um, uh, I think David is very capable of doing that. You know, I, I think you know, uh, this is something I, I think that should be very integral uh, to the U.S. Uh, chairmanship. Very important point. Um, I also wanted to talk about you know, the two 
uh, scenarios, you know, that you mentioned, the uh, inevitable uh, strategic spillover or, uh, you know, the Arctic being, um, you know, able to, you know, to move forward. And I think uh, Andre was very clear uh, on the areas that are there for cooperation. And I very much hope that, you know, that that is the case. Um, I, I, I think that there are good possibilities, you know, in the Arctic, things that we probably haven't touched on that may contribute to the more constructive uh, element. One is that uh, the oil and gas development, the business development, as Andre mentioned, some of the decisions on the extended uh, continental shelf may not come for 10 to 15 years. There's time. I mean, there, there's nothing, you know, that there's no pressing issue that, you know, that, uh, you know on the security side that's going to cause us to, you know, to move one way or the other. There's plenty of opportunity, uh, you know, to work on these environmental issues, the cooperative side, and to help prevent, you know, any of the uh, untoward effects. Um, obviously, you know, we're going to watch very, very closely. I um, am one, uh, we just had an op-ed, I think, I hope it comes out today, but uh, we were talking about uh, the impact of public opinion on whether there'll be a quote-unquote new Cold War. And we were pointing out that, you know, both in Russia, in Europe, and the United States, there really is no popular desire, you know, to move back, you know, to a Cold War. Obviously, what happened in Crimea is very popular in Russia, but that doesn't seem to extend to extending hostilities, you know, across Ukraine or doing anything, you know, much more drastic. So my hope is that, you know, there may be a floor or a ceiling, however you wish, you know, to, you know, to, you know, to describe this. Obviously, um, the relationship is badly frayed and is going to have to be rebuilt, but I do think the Arctic you know, is one area where we have enough common interests uh, and enough time, you know, to be able to do that. And I, I, as I said, you know, the realists disagree, but uh, I'm also a realist and I disagree with them. But, and I know, uh, I don't want to steal Lawson Brigham's thunder because he's going to do a great uh, presentation on some of the, the maritime issues. But we are seeing some very interesting developments on the security side, the creation of an Arctic Coast Guard Forum, which will be formally launched in the fall. We do have this conversation. We're searching for this venue, uh, but it's a search because we, we need to cooperate. We need to implement agreements that have been signed, and how do we put them in practice? So I, I agree with you. There's, there's a lot of room for work there, but we're, we're formulating. And, and our U.S. Coast Guard is taking a great leadership role in that. Andre, sharing your thoughts, and then we'll we'll unleash the audience on you. Uh, thank you, and let me be brief. Uh, my understanding may be wrong, but my understanding of uh, the purpose of the Business Council uh, was to allow the Arctic Council member states and the businesses which have interest in the Arctic to start talking to each other on issues which are of interest to them, because. The basic intrigue was that uh, every government, although to a different extent, was interested in getting businesses involved, uh, particularly uh, on issues such as developing infrastructure. Uh, there are certainly businesses which have a stake uh, there, particularly those looking at the mineral resources development, etc. But otherwise, businesses uh, on their side were very much ignorant uh, and had little interest in what the Arctic Council was doing until a moment when the Arctic Council member states started to produce agreements. <laughs> and then businesses were waking up and saying, okay, hi guys, look here, you start regulating here something, and you don't talk to us, you don't look at our interests. So uh, businesses are, of course, uh, rather, most of the businesses are rather hesitant in going into the Arctic, except for uh, getting contracts for doing something, like construction of a new harbor, uh, of Sabeta in Russia or whatever else. So, uh, but uh, the moment Arctic, Arctic Council states begin regulating specific areas of operation, and there will be more of such regulation, not necessarily through the Arctic Council, but if you look at the polar code, this will affect uh, construction plans for the ships, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Businesses uh, start getting interested in, in at least understanding uh, what is approaching to them. This was actually exactly what I was discussing with businesses in Russia, with businesses which are involved in the Arctic, uh, looking for funding from this side of some of our research, uh -huh. and telling, okay, we are looking at the Arctic Council, and the Arctic Council begins uh, talking about rules, 
which may be tougher over time. And uh, this is something, uh, if we do research, we can make you know uh, what is forthcoming, what is being discussed, and you also can see for the ways you can affect those decisions. So my understanding is that the uh, business council so far is an attempt to bring governments and uh, businesses together and start talking about those issues. Well, realizing that the interests are different so far, but starting an approach which is very helpful uh, for looking at Arctic uh, economics. On the geopolitics, well, uh, I well understand that we can reasonably argue for both cases because we do see both. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't know yet what is going to prevail, uh, spillover uh, to the Arctic or or uh, the possibility for cooperation because, in fact, before the Ukraine crisis, we, while working on the Arctic cooperation issues uh, within the Russian International Affairs Council, our basic idea was to explore new opportunities for cooperation, not least for U.S.-Russia cooperation, in order to establish more cooperative platforms, uh, like working together on the chemical weapons in Syria, for instance establishing more cooperative platforms to expand cooperation to different sectors and to, to look for new avenues for cooperation. Well, understanding this would hardly be a game changer, but one more element of cooperation on an issue which is of importance to Russia. At least publicly it is an important issue. It is important for the uh, establishment, and this is something uh, where cooperative experiences uh, would be of importance uh, in terms of building trust, etc. So we now see that we do already have some spillover because military-to-military -military cooperation is suspended. Uh, and all uh, other related activities are suspended, uh, on which we counted. Uh, we do see uh, increasing compartmentalization, particularly in security activities in the Arctic. This raises a lot of suspicion in Russia, which is traditionally linked to the uh, NATO alliance, saying, look, four of the five uh, are NATO member states. They now expel us, throw us out from cooperation, no longer invite for observation of maneuvers, do hold maneuvers more recently as well, uh, with a different scenario than before. And this, of course, increases mistrust, and at least uh, inc uh, supports those groups within the country, uh, which are ringing alarm bells, saying, oh, no, no, there's no cooperation going to be there, because they the others uh, have their special uh, uh, idea on this. So we do see both these uh, this, uh, tendencies. We also see the trend that uh, although having d different uh, policies uh, with regard to Russia in the current situation, but basically all Arctic Council states have uh, spared much of the effort to shield the Arctic Council to the extent possible uh, from the overspill. So we do see intention within the Arctic Council to, to go ahead. There have been few cases where Canadian authorities were not attending meetings in Moscow, but basically the agenda was uh, proceeding uh, uh, as it was anticipated in, in the Kiruna ministerial meeting. Uh, and my point uh, would be very simple. We can go either way. <laughs> we, can go, we can either uh, uh, go the way of increasing uh, compartmentalization in the Arctic, or we can uh, improve cooperation. It will depend very much on decisions we take on the Arctic, but also will depend very much on, on, on how successful we are in overcoming the current crisis over Ukraine. Uh, and uh, definitely, if we have a situation like we have now, no cooperation on Arctic issues would uh, change it. So I would not expand, ex expect a, spill, a cooperative spillover from the Arctic to the Ukraine crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, the Arctic cooperation is vulnerable to us. But the moment we overcome or move towards overcoming the crisis, and the moment, uh, particularly in a situation when the chemistry doesn't work between the two countries or two governments, at the moment uh, any government is interested in, in making steps towards cooperation, we can grab the opportunities which exist in different areas, and particularly in the Arctic. So even, even small steps could be a sign of moving ahead and thus helping us to overcome the, the fallout uh, of the recent crisis. Fantastic. All right. Uh, I'm sure, the, oh, I see the hands are flying. That's what we like. Um, so again, 
uh, colleagues, get your pens and pencils ready because we're you're about to get uh, a lot of incoming here. So I'm going to begin with the Tom Axworthy, uh, and then we'll go to Caitlin, and then we have a colleague over there, and I promise we'll hit this side of the room. We're going to bundle, so we'll keep our questions short, and then we'll let our panelists uh, offer their their reflections. Uh, good morning, Tom Axworthy from the Gordon Foundation in Canada. I'm just going to put the question out. I was going to. Um, have this as some of my remarks this afternoon, but the security issue has been raised several times uh, in this morning's panel. So uh, the basic point I want to make is that um, uh, it, it, it's just not extremists who are raising the security dimension of the Arctic. Uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, six weeks ago in Canada, talked about how Canada and the United States should vigorously protest Russia's mili uh, renewed militarization of the Arctic because of the opening of the naval base and, uh, and the, um, the uh, airports and uh, runways and so on. So th this is a large issue growing at very high levels, not, not just the usual suspects. So uh, the, the main uh, issue that I wanted to make, though, is that if this is important, we have no forum at the moment to even discuss it. Uh, military security is explicitly in a huge mistake, but nonetheless ex uh, excluded from the Arctic Council. Um, I believe, I can be corrected, but I'm pretty sure on this that the NATO-Russia forum has never ever really discussed uh, the Arctic. There have been informal meetings of chiefs and staffs and so on, but there's no institution around arms control, confidence building measures, or the usual infrastructure we have to, to exactly put a peaceful dimension to the security uh, dilemma, nothing exists in the Arctic. So one of the essential questions is, where, what mechanism do we use in order to ensure that the action response mechanisms, which we're just starting to see in the Arctic, someone does something and someone gets worried about it and someone does something else, uh, what is the forum that begins to lower that temperature? Do we have to create a specific task force or set of meetings around those states? Can we, can we put it on the NATO-Russia forum agenda? But we're not going to have any progress on this until we have an actual institution mechanism to really talk about it. Great question, Tom. Thank you so much. Caitlin. Uh, Caitlin Antrim, Rule of Law Committee for the Ocean. I want to go in a different direction from the previous one. Um, here in Washington, we look at Arctic as if Washington and Ottawa and Moscow are in the heart of the Arctic. We didn't see much happen with the U.S.-Russia reset because that was mostly a federal government to federal government initiative. What can we do in the Arctic to promote collaboration regionally and in the different sectors, industry, environmental protection, fishery management, those things that involve the people in the Arctic, can we make that work without having everything funneled through the Arctic Council and funneled through the federal governments? Pen Moore comes to mind and regional collaboration. Excellent. I think we had uh, Oliver Questioner there. Leandra Bernstein, RIA Novosti. Uh, this is a question on the prospects for the volume of trade in the Arctic. Uh, I know that last year we saw the first Arctic voyage by the Chinese, and uh, from what I understand, they used uh, the requirements of the Russian Federation to make their voyage. Uh, so what, what are the prospects for volume of trade in shipping, also the prospects for crossing the Bering Strait via railroad, and uh, just those challenges, and if you could further address the challenges of, uh, of the conventions for this. I want to make sure if there aren't any more, oh, wonderful, we have a hand way over there. And then with that question, we'll let our panelists. Oh, yeah, we have it coming right over there. Fatima Tlis, Voice of America. My question is probably related to the issue of trust 
Uh, many experts agree that uh, Russian media has become a mirror of Kremlin's intentions, a fairly accurate mirror. So uh, right now we see on Twitter and in Russian media trending topics, Krim Nash, hashtag Krim Nash, which means Crimea is ours. Equally trending is the hashtag uh, Alaska Nasha, which means uh, Alaska is ours. How much this represents the intentions, the true intentions of Kremlin, and is there really an issue of trust? Thank you. Oh dear. I'm going to give you time to think on that one, Dr. Zagorski. Uh, I'll just keep, uh, we'll go Dave, Ken, and then Andre. Thank you again for the very good questions. Uh, uh, it's a very good question on the forum. Uh, let me tell you that many people have been raising the issue and it was discussed in various ways. Uh, and uh, uh, well, first of all, I would like to state that uh, in general in Russia there is uh, uh, an openness to discussing the issue and introducing um, uh, issues of security, cooperation or security as such, uh, into any framework uh, of Arctic cooperation. Uh, well, Russian NATO Council is not uh, a venue for Russia to address those issues. I believe some other countries also wouldn't like to go to NATO or NATO Russia Council, so this is out of question for Russia. Uh, I haven't uh, seen any proper discussion on whether or not Russia would be open to changing the uh, Ottawa Declaration and admitting security issues into, into the Arctic Council framework. My feeling would be that if that would be an option uh, acceptable to others, Moscow would not uh, be against it. But uh, basically, and this would be the third option, the expectation uh, in Moscow was very simple. Uh, so Moscow was looking forward to increased cooperation, including cooperation on security issues and well aware of the hesitance on the side of some other Arctic Council member states, uh, Moscow was prepared to a gradual approach, uh, expecting that uh, something would grow out of the initially small formats we have had, particularly the, the, the heads of staff meetings uh, that could be eventually institutionalized at some point in time, but all, already seeing this as a very important avenue uh, for heads of staff meeting with each other and talking about Arctic issues, particularly talking about challenges and operative situation and opportunities for cooperation in what, to what extent military uh, stru structures can contribute to uh, addressing uh, soft security issues uh, in the Arctic. So we do have the security round table, which also involves some non-Arctic countries, which was a low key uh, uh, element for Russia, which was less political. Uh, and uh, I practically don't see references to this uh, uh, venue in, in, the, in the Russian uh, uh, sources. And there have been several, or a few other, because we do have it in the North Pacific and in the North Atlantic uh, frameworks for, for uh, Coast Guards to meet and talk to each other. As I understand, the North Pacific Forum has been so far closed for uh, Russia. Uh, so again, uh, Russia was not pushing on the issue, uh, but Russia would be open to discussing and expecting that some of the initial rudimental uh, forms would grow out, and if not ne necessarily directly included on the Arctic Council, uh, but would be to some in, in some informal way linked to this, as we have seen this on other instances, uh, because Arctic Council was in that sense a very flex flexible structure. When we had a meeting of uh, environmental ministers, uh, it was not formally within the Arctic Council framework. It was just simply formally a Swedish initiative during the chairmanship, but it was linked to developments within the Arctic Council. So any sort of affiliated activities uh, would be welcome, and indeed, indeed, uh, um, uh, Moscow is open to discussing this issue, but is not pushing well understanding the reservations of um, other countries. Uh, it is a lot of things to be done to improve cooperation among the people, and let me uh, first of all state that many things do happen uh, now already. Uh, there is a lot uh, happening in the western part of the Arctic through the uh, Barents and Arctic uh, Regional uh, Council, 
uh, which has spent much money on a lot of projects, not only on environmental projects, which are uh, a key interest, but also on many projects, transborder projects, including uh, bringing businesses together, uh, mostly along the Norwegian-Russian border, but also extending this cooperation to some uh, other areas. Uh, we do have, we do see a role of different Russian regions in various, uh, I, I don't speak of the indigenous population because they are sitting on the Arctic Council uh, as a permanent member and uh, are involved very much in the circumpolar cooperative structures of indigenous population organizations. But uh, regional uh, regions of Russia have been to a different extent active in, in promoting their agenda, both vis-a-vis -vis Moscow but also within different regional structures. Uh, it is better established within the uh, Barren Sea uh, Euro-Arctic region because we do have there a special regional council, council of uh, regions uh, which are represented on this, uh, which are a parallel stru structure to the uh, council as such. But there is also a northern forum in which uh, several regions like Yakutia or uh, Yamal uh, are pretty, pretty active. And this needs to be encouraged because the more we have direct cooperation, uh, yeah, the, the better the better it is and uh, <coughs> uh, on the on the uh, shipping issues uh, I am not skeptic but uh, I am cautious uh, in projecting uh, shipping growth uh, so far although we do register developments not only along the northern sea route in Russia but also northwest passage last year 22 transit shippings well, two thirds of this being uh, international, which is a remarkable development, I would say, for Canada. Uh, but uh, for me, uh, if we speak of a proper transit shipping, which means uh, the, uh, or the one originated outside the route and ending also outside the route, uh, this is mostly experimental so far for many uh, various reasons. And uh, certainly the Arctic Ocean is, in the foreseeable time, not fit for the container shipments. So it's mainly about bulkers and uh, uh, tankers. And it's very much experimental. My expectation is that uh, particularly uh, vessel traffic along the Northern Sea Route is going to grow uh, over the coming years, but primarily through the destination shipping which means bringing necessary stuff into the region, particularly for the construction, which is now uh, over 40% of the whole shipment along the Northern Sea Route. And then increasingly, increasingly by exporting uh, through marine exports of the resources extracted, extracted uh, on, the, on the shore, not off the shore, but on the shore. And uh, if I particularly look at the capacities of the uh, new harbor of Sabeta, which is 15 million ton, and another one, uh, oil terminal uh, in the same region. Uh, my expectation would be, when I look at different projections, um, 40 million tons, 40 to 50 million tons from 2020 and beyond, maybe, maybe the most uh, reasonable, although conservative estimate, but it would be destination. It would be not, not so much uh, transit. Bering Strait, we do see the increasing traffic there. It has uh, grown by a factor four over the past six years. And if we project more destination uh, uh, shipping, I would expect that particularly in the, in the summer season, uh, there will be uh, more traffic there. And this presses on us to introduce some regulation which will be environmentally friendly. Uh, particularly since uh, both the Bering Strait and the Bering Sea is a biologically very, very productive uh, region. And both U.S. and Russia have uh, a lot of uh, interests in uh, conservation of biological resources and their rational exploitation. So we need, this is why we also say in our report, we need to look into the issue of how we best manage the traffic through the Bering Strait and we uh, do some groundwork uh, to offer our government some proposals on this. And, uh, well, Alaska, Nasha, our Alaska, I think this is very different from the Crimea issue. <coughs> but uh, to, uh, to add to the joke, uh, uh, to add to the joke, there have been some uh, non-governmental uh, organizations in Russia who tried to sue the U.S. 
for not living up to the conditions of the purchase of uh, Alaska, <laughs> and particularly by, by violating the traditional uh, understanding uh, of, of uh, the values by the uh, originally Russian population of Alaska, and this is linked, this is linked to the gays' rights, uh, et cetera, et cetera, violating the understanding uh, of values, et cetera. Uh, but this all has uh, failed, of course. There is uh, some debate, it's not, not very much debate on this, but there is some debate uh, in the internet, particularly uh, there have been several initiatives, but this is definitely not the governmental policy. I don't know where we go from there, but go right ahead. <laughs> well, I, I will start where uh, Professor Zagorski left off. So hashtag Alaska is ours. Um, I want to start a hashtag, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> um, I don't regard this as a, a serious point of view uh, from within Russia, but the larger question you raise about the need to continue to build trust is a serious issue. That is true. Um, and, but the only answer I really have for that is to continue to pursue the interests we share with Russia in the Arctic, and they are profound. Both of us need a stable, rules-based Arctic. It's in both countries' fundamental interests. That is why we have seen the type of cooperation, even back in the days of the Soviet Union, but really in the last 15 years in particular, um, that is something that links our two countries' destinies, a stable, rules-based Arctic. Um, and that is not a bad place from which to build, continue to build trust. Um, I don't have very much to add on the prospects for trade and Arctic shipping um, in answer to that question to what Professor Zagorski has already said. To um, the question about what are we doing in the region, that is a good question as well. And yes, there is a tendency to, um, especially in places like this, to think about the Arctic uh, from a remove. One of the things that the Canadians deserve credit for in the way they are handling their chairmanship is to try to bring more of the Arctic Council work back down to the level of the people who actually live there to engage the industries, um, the indigenous communities, even more that's been done in the past, something I would like to see us continue. And if you spend time in Alaska, you will know that the Arctic is not exactly a single region. We have two immediate neighbors in the Arctic, Canada and Russia, and there's a lot that is already going on, I would say, at the regional level, that sub-regional level, uh, that our federal government is not necessarily involved in, or in any event in the lead on, um, but is nevertheless of great interest to the people who are there, and perhaps our best role is to facilitate and get out of the way. Um, Tom Axworthy, I don't know that I have a good answer to your question. It is an important one. I can tell you that people within our government now are trying to figure it out. Um, do we need, you seem, you, you seem to start from the assumption that we absolutely do need some new place to go to take these issues. I would say the question being debated is whether we really need something new or whether something that already exists can be adapted for this purpose. Um, and uh, we don't have an answer yet. Um, and you, I think Patrick's work to be sub-supported or as part of the Arctic Council overall in the Arctic Council is an example. I'd like to use that measure to follow up. Specialty. Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about that later in your session. <laughs> Ken, did you want to? Ken, you yeah, have the just, last just a, minute wrap up. Okay, just a very few brief points. Um, I, you know, I agree on the need. You know, trust has clearly, you know, been broken, and it's going to have to be uh, rebuilt. Um, I'm hoping, as I've said, I'm not going to repeat myself. I do believe the Arctic, you know, can be um, a region where, you know, where we can rebuild <laughs> trust. Uh, we probably had closer cooperation in the Arctic than in many other areas. I mean, this is a long-standing, you know, area of cooperation. There have been very strong relationships that have been built up between scientists uh, and a whole variety of people. And I, I do think that, uh, you know, that that 
you know, does give, you know, the, the, the hope that, uh, you know, that the Arctic, you know, can remain, uh, you know, a, uh, you know, I won't call it an island, but an area where we can, uh, you know, cooperate uh, very, very much. And I think uh, Caitlin's point on the regional cooperation is very good. I would love to see uh, a conference devoted to regional cooperation in the Arctic because my guess is that there's an awful lot going on that we're unaware of and could really uh, buttress the fact that, you know, that things are, are moving along in, in a rather uh, constructive way. I'm always reminded in this country, you know, that uh, we often look to states and local government, you know, to do things uh, on environment, on other issues when the federal government is paralyzed or when Congress is paralyzed. Uh, and I think, you know, we can, we can actually learn, uh, you know, much more. On Tom's point on the security forum, uh, my guess is that in the current environment, it's probably going to be hard to come up with uh, some, something new. Uh, and I think the best uh, possibility, because I think there is a need, uh, we've seen, you know, the two uh, binding agreements now that have come, you know, through the Arctic Council shepherding. And my guess is that this is a need that is increasingly, you know, going to be felt. Uh, and whether it's going to be a new forum ultimately or a, a subgroup within the Arctic Council, uh, my guess is that this is something, you know, that, that we will see. So I think you're absolutely right in pointing it out, and I would like to see some progress on it. Okay, well, my CSIS to-do list, Regional Cooperation Conference, Security Forum, further discussion. Thank you. I now have a nice uh, to-do list myself. Uh, thank you uh, to our panelists for, for, again, starting this conversation off in the right direction. We're going to continue to have this discussion. Ambassador Bolton and Dr. Zagorski are going to come back in the afternoon and put their fisheries hat on, talk a little fish um, and marine uh, environment. Woo! And uh, so here's my instruction. We are going to take a five minute break literally to reset up here and to ask our, our next panelist to come up. If you have to dash, refill your cup of coffee, but don't go away uh, because if we run too far over, lunch is in jeopardy time-wise. So thank you so much. Please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>